Hi friends, welcome to Water Bear Reads where I chat about illustrated classics and modern classics. My name is Heather and it is September! I am so happy, I love September. September is such a beautiful month because all the flowers are still blooming and the hardy, beautiful plants start coming into bloom like the sunflowers and the goldenrod and the purple loose strife. And then later on in the month, the apples are ripe for picking and it is just a mixture of so many beautiful colors with some of the leaves already beginning to change but yet there's still blooms. It's such a beautiful month. Later this month we'll do apple picking and enjoy a corn maze at one of our local farms and it's just splendid. It's just such a wonderful time. All these thoughts of sunflowers and corn mazes and such put in mind a book that I always feel is a great book to read this time of year and that is The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by Frank Baum and I thought that I would jump on here and share my collection of illustrated Wonderful Wizard of Oz's with you guys. A couple of years ago I did an Illustrator Explorer and put it on my website and I've been doing an update. I've um, acquired a few new versions and I've added those versions over the last couple of weeks to my website so I'll put a link in the description box for those of you who want to see more Wizards of Oz that I haven't shown you here. For those of you who are new to my channel, I enjoy as a sort of hobby collecting various versions of classics and doing blog posts about all the versions that are out there that you can purchase. I don't buy all the books. A great many of them I source from my library. But what inevitably happens when I do these illustrator explorers is I tend to fall in love with <laughs> the books when I'm reading about them and learning about them. As you tend to understand something, then you tend to fall in love with it and that happens to me all the time. I felt it was really good timing for this video because Wicked is coming out later this autumn and I also thought maybe some of you out there might want to reread The Wizard of Oz or buy a version for your children or your grandchildren and so I just thought it would be a great time to do this video. I have vintage editions, brand new editions, adapted versions, condensed versions to show you. Well, let me get to the books. I ran out to Starbucks. I'm having a green matcha latte because it's green. I thought it would be appropriate. <laughs> I'm going to take a sip and we'll get started. I thought I would just begin at the beginning and show you the original version of The Wizard of Oz by W.W. W. Denslow. William Wallace Denslow and L. Frank Baum had been working together already and I believe it was the Father Goose book that really made a name for L. Frank Baum. When L. Frank Baum wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, they continued their relationship and William Wallace Denslow or W.W. W. Denslow illustrated it for him. When W.W. W. Denslow and L. Frank Baum were having this published, the publisher said they could not add color to the book, it would just be too expensive, unless they paid for the color plates themselves. And so Denslow and Baum paid for the color plates and really fought for color in this version. Color is such a big part of The Wizard of Oz. It had to be published that way. If you know the 1939 film by MGM, they used color to pioneer the use of um, Technicolor in movies. And the first time I saw this one, I did not expect it to look so adorable and actually quite modern. I was very impressed. W.W. W. Denslow and L. Frank Bauman unfortunately had a falling out and so this is the only one of the Oz books that W.W. W. Denslow illustrated. I believe the issue was over rights. They shared the rights to The Wizard of Oz. I believe Denslow went further with it and created some books about the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and then there was also a theater production and I'm not really sure exactly what happened but there was some disagreement about rights and then unfortunately after that they no longer work together and Frank Baum decided to start having John R. Neal illustrate the rest of the Oz books. Um, anyway, so this version is the one that I have and it's really cute and I'll show you under the j dust jacket. It's got the Wizard of Oz book here. The original version was published on May 15th, 1900 by George M. Hill Publishers and then of course there have been a ton that have been published since. Look at this cute end paper. What I found particularly interesting was on this page it says copyright 1899 
by L. Frank Baum and W. W. Denslow, all rights reserved. Both of them had their names to the right, so I thought that was interesting that they had a page there for that. But here's some example of the illustrations. Another thing about Denslow's work was that it really set the tone for all Wizards of Oz to come. And what he did was he pioneered using color in all the different lands. So you have Kansas, which is the dark color, and also pay attention to the, the cyclone, the tornado that picks up Dorothy's house because that's another thing that sort of set the tone for all Wizards of Oz to come is the way that he designed the cyclone or tornado picking it up. Technically it's a tornado but it's called the cyclone. T cyclones are over the ocean and tornadoes are on land but we'll just call it the cyclone. So Kansas is brown and then you get to Munchkin land and here by the way is another iconic image the house with the witch's feet sticking out. This was, by the way, my son's favorite image. He was just completely enthralled with someone's feet sticking out from a house. It just <laughs> utterly charmed him. I think that's an image that really speaks to kids' imagination. Here's another one with the scarecrow, with the crows. It's just, see how gorgeous they are? And you get to the poppy fields and the color changes. I think it's supposed to be red, but it was just the colors that were available at the time. And then you get to the outskirts of Oz and everything becomes green. And here we are in the land of the Winkies, which is yellow. Also, I wanted to show you one of the color plates as well, because they're also quite charming. Here's Dorothy and the Scarecrow. And they're throughout. In this particular version, they're printed on glossy paper. But yeah, just such a wonderful version of The Wizard of Oz, the original. Speaking of the 1939 film by MGM, it's difficult to um, have a discussion about any illustrators to come without acknowledging that film and its effect on The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz film with Judy Garland came out at a time of great insecurity. It came out in theaters a week before World War II was declared when Germany invaded Poland. The Wizard of Oz movie was released on August 25th, 1939. And the movie is so iconic in so many ways, but I think its biggest achievement was in how it inspired hope for people at the time when, when everything was looking a bit dark. We had just come out of the Great Depression too, and the movie just inspired so much hope with its songs of Somewhere Over the Rainbow and its overall message. And I know a lot of people give the movie credit for being the first time movie was made in color, but that's not actually true. There were a few other examples of movies that had been made in color. Snow White, for example, was the first animated film that w had been color, Disney's version of Snow White, and that had come out, I think, two years before, in 1937. Um, but it was the first time that people really saw what you could do and what you could achieve with the use of Technicolor and change the way that movies were made forever thereafter. But anyway, this whole discussion is so that I could introduce the first illustrated version to come 44 years after the original. Um, and that is by Evelyn Kopelman. And the version I have here is the Illustrated Junior Library Edition. Um, but it was first published in 1944, and you can definitely see the influence that the movie had on the illustrator, which is no wonder because in 1944 we were in the throes of World War II, and the publishers wanted to continue that message of hope that the uh, movie had established. You can see it in her version of the Scarecrow, who looks identical to Ray Bulger, who played the scarecrow in the movie. And then you can also see it in the skin color of the Wicked Witch of the West, which was an MGM invention, along with the ruby slippers. She was not green in the book, she was green in the movie. And the reason why the movie chose to do that was to show off the colors, the Technicolor. Um, so in the book, the shoes are silver, but it just pops more if you use ruby red. And then of course, making the witch green and as green as they chose to make her. She is really green. <laughs> but anyway, so just wanting to show off what can be achieved with the use of Technicolor was the decision making behind varying from the text. This one, by the way, 
has five less color illustrations than previous versions. There's a, another YouTuber who did, who did a wonderful video about Evelyn Kopelman in the different versions, and I'll put the link to his video below and you can check it out. Um, he did a great job on it. Her lion looks a lot like the original WW Denslow, but I think it's adorable. And I'm always a sucker for spot illustrations. When illustration is put in amongst text, I love that. But yeah, so that would be Evelyn Kopelman. The next one I want to show you was published in 1955 by Nelson Doubleday as part of their Junior Deluxe Editions, and it's illustrated by Leonard Weisgard. He was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and he spent a little bit of time in England and then returned to New York at the age of eight, and then in his later years he lived in Denmark, and he spent the rest of his life in Denmark. His version has one color illustration, which I think is just beautiful. And the rest are all black and white line drawings, but they're really nice. I like them very much. Like here's the Tin Man, here's the Queen of the Mice. You wouldn't guess it, but he was actually influenced by cave paintings and Gothic art. Most of his work is um, related to Margaret Wise Brown, who wrote the Golden Egg Book. I have it inside this, um, the little golden book collection of animal tales. Here's some of his work that he did. But yeah, a lot of his illustrations are done in collaboration with Margaret Wise Brown. I also think The Little Island, which is a popular one around here, because it's um, set off the coast of Maine. He also has um, a version of Heidi out, and he's the illustrator for The Courage of Sarah Noble, which is a wonderful book. I read it a couple of years ago, and I thought it was really good. So, and this is one of my favorites, and it was published in 1957 by Lubico Maraja. Lubico Maraja is from the Italian-speaking area of southern Switzerland and during his time he was one of the most revered illustrators in Italy and he has illustrated many classics Pinocchio, Gulliver's Travels, Alice in Wonderland, um, A Christmas Carol and those are just the ones in English. There's a whole slew of others that are published in Italian. And this edition is chock full of his artwork. There's not a single page unadorned. I'll show some of you. First, there's this cute little book plate. There's the witch's feet sticking out from the house that I always look for. Here they are walking through the poppy field. Oh, and I just had to show you this one because I think it's adorable. It's the queen of the mice. And she's just so cute. And I love how he made her green. And then here's his version of the Wicked Witch of the West. And one of the things I didn't tell you guys before is that in the book there's a description about how Dorothy is dressed and when she gets to Munchkinland she runs back into the house and she puts on her blue gingham dress but then when she gets to Oz she is dressed in, in green which we know as we read through Wizard of Oz that everyone was wearing green glasses and so I think the general consensus is that the material was actually white that she was wearing after their first visit to the Emerald City. But yeah, this is just a splendid version. If you're going to go vintage, I would go with this version. If you want vintage, if you want color, this version by Miraja is a perfect one to go for. So yeah, that's 1957 Miraja. So the wonderful Wizard of Oz entered public domain in 1956. So after 1956, many versions of the Wizard of Oz began to be produced with different illustrators. There are a great many. But going back to 1957, and a very special version, one that my grandparents had in their home, is this version illustrated by Russell H. Schultz, another illustrator who I had a time figuring out any information about. And the illustrations are one or two per chapter, but they are only in one color, green. Here he pays homage to W.W. Denslow's illustration with the tornado picking up the house. I just think they're really beautiful. Dorothy here is a blonde, as was in the, in the Miraja version as well. And here's a scene from the end with the cowardly lion. What's really nice is when you actually read the book, there is so much more to it. There's, of course, backstory about the scarecrow and the tin man and the cowardly lion, but there's also examples of when each one of them had to show that what they were searching for and what they were going to see the wizard about, they already actually had. 
And um, you see examples of it both in the beginning, before they get to the Emerald City, and then you see it as well after they tackle the Wicked Witch of the West. And I find that just wonderful that they're looking for something that they already have, you know. And this version will always be special to me. And it is the version that I read to my son when he was four years old. And we turned around and reread it as soon as we were done. I picked it back up and reread it because he loved the story that much. Moving along in 1963, published by Grosset and Dunlop as part of the Companion Library series, is The Wizard of Oz, illustrated by Anna Maria Magagna. And I don't know if I'm saying her name correctly. I try to make up for it by putting the names of people on the screen. And her illustrations are wonderful. She did leave the blue gingham on for the entire story on Dorothy. And also I will say it's um, a little sparser illustrated than um, some of the other versions that I've picked up. But nonetheless, her illustrations are beautiful. So here's when Dorothy meets the Scarecrow for the first time. And here you can see she's wearing her blue gingham when she confronts the witch with a bucket of water. It's a really pretty version. I really like these and I really love the spine as well. And what's remarkable about Anna Maria Magagna is that she not only illustrated many children's classics, I think Five Little Peppers and How They Grew, Little Men, as well as Little Women. She was in the fashion industry. I just think that this is a wonderful version and beautiful. And I know this is one of the prettier vintage versions out there too. I love this cover. The 1980s version that I think is sort of iconic for kids who grew up in the 80s and 90s is The Wizard of Oz, illustrated by Michael Haig. In looking through this, it's difficult to understand why it took um, upwards of five years for Michael Haig to actually um, get a job as an illustrator. He really struggled. When he did eventually get hired, his illustrations would sometimes be altered without his consent. It was just a rough ride for him and he got his big break from Cricket Magazine when Trina Shart Hyman hired him to illustrate a work called The Porcelain Cat by Michael Patrick Hearn in their February 1977 edition, which I don't have, but I do have this one, which is from April 1977, which has his illustration on the cover. Sorry about the tea mark or the coffee mark. Oh, and also on the back cover as well. And so I just, I had to laugh because it was Cr Cricket Magazine that gave Michael Haig his big break. And soon after he illustrated his version of The Wind in the Willows. And that was a huge success. And so that kind of set him up and he started illustrating other books. I think that followed with Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales. He trained in Los Angeles and then moved to Colorado Springs and he spent about a year planning this version of The Wizard of Oz. He wanted to do something different. He wanted to create something totally unique. And I think he did a wonderful job. Let me show you a couple. Of course, there's these end papers, which are lovely. One of the things I really love is that the Scarecrow is sitting here reading his version of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales, which I thought was really cute. Here's an interesting perspective. And he is one of the first illustrators to put that cow in the background. <laughs> I've seen it in later editions, but I haven't seen it in anything earlier unless I just missed it, but, or if it's one of the editions that I don't have. And then I, of course I had to show you this one because of the sunflower. So what Michael Haig did is he wanted to pay tribute to Denslow's original illustrations where he marked each land with its own color. but what he did instead was to use a sort of wash to cover um, the pictures as if you're looking through glasses that are tinted that color and so here you have munchkin land emerald city and here's the yellow land the land of the winkies he he also wanted to make sure that he stayed away from any previous representations of the tin man and so he came up with the tin man with a colander on the top of his head this is one of my favorite illustrations in the whole book. I love it. And I love that lion. If you're out and about and you just want a paperback version to enjoy, I would just go with the Puffin Classics, The Wizard of Oz. In them are illustrations by David McKee, who you might know from his Elmer series. David McKee is a British illustrator and he has these gentle, quirky illustrations that I really enjoyed. And in this version, almost every chapter has at least one full page illustration. Here's one of them, when Dorothy first meets the 
scarecrow. And here's when Toto is barking at the cowardly lion and he's getting a bit afraid. But see how cute and quirky they are. And it's just a sweet little version to carry around. And I have found other paperback versions, but I think this is my favorite. Um, there are older versions of this. I saw his illustration copyright was from 1982. They republished it in this beautiful version from, and I think it was 2015 when this came out. British illustrator David McKee. The next one I have for you, I only have the condensed or adapted version. There is actually an original version that is wonderful and I wish I had it. When I did my Illustrator Explorer I loaned it from the library but I did come across this condensed version. It's by Greg Hildebrandt. Greg Hildebrandt was based in Detroit and he was one of a twin brother team. He and his brother created this beautiful Lord of the Rings calendar and they illustrated the, I think it was the third poster for Star Wars when it first came out in 1977. Eventually they decided to go their own way and do their own thing. And Greg Hildebrandt started illustrating classics. He's done Pinocchio and Robin Hood and several others. I love this version. I feel like when you look into his illustrations, you can really fall into them. The use of light is just amazing. But I would tell you that I think this is one for a little bit of a um, slightly older audience, maybe 10 to 12 years and up. I'm not great at ages, but I just know that some kids might get scared at some of the images. So I just wanted to show you some of his work and then I'll show you one of those images as well. Here's his version. I just love this one. This, the way the scarecrow is portrayed and the way you can just fall inside it, it's amazing to me. Here's where the cowardly lion scares the care sca Here's where the cowardly lion scares the scarecrow for the first time. Then here's an example of one of the images that I think will show you that it's kind of it can be a bit scary. So I just wanted to let you guys know that. But otherwise, this is just such a beautiful version and the unadapted version, the original version, is so beautiful. It has, I think it has green cloth on the outside. It's just a beautiful version. Greg Hildebrandt's illustrations were published in, I think they first came out in 1985, and, um, and they've been republished since then. But yeah, that's Greg Hildebrandt. The next one I have is from 1996, and it's North South's version, illustrated by Lisbeth Sveger and I love it. I particularly love this cover. It is so beautiful. One thing that I find so wonderful about this version is how everyone is dressed and I think it's so interesting. I think that Lisbeth Sveger really paid attention to the descriptions. This is the first version that includes the green glasses with the book so that's really amazing. And if you're buying it secondhand, do make sure that you get the glasses because the Emerald City is illustrated in white in this book. I suppose if you do get a version that doesn't have them, I guess you can just make your own using green cellophane and some cardboard. But but yeah, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, Lisbeth Sverger is a Viennese illustrator. And if you are a Harry Potter fan, there is a version of Beetle the Bard that you might recognize. And she's illustrated a ton of classics. Almost every single illustrator explorer that I have embarked upon has a version illustrated by Lisbeth Sverger. <laughs> and here I just wanted to just tell you this part about the glasses that it reads. It says, Dear reader, you will find a pair of green glasses slipped into the back of this book. The great Wizard of Oz has decreed that you must wear them when you enter his wonderful Emerald City. Wherever you see the little symbol of glasses at the bottom of the page next to the page number, you will know that it is time to put on your glasses. If you don't see the symbol, you may remove the glasses. Do not dare disobey the will of the great and terrible Oz. And here I'll show you one of those illustrations where you have to wear glasses, if you can see the glasses at the bottom of the page. So I thought that was really fun. And I wanted to read to you a couple of the passages that ch talk about what Dorothy's wearing. And here is one right here where Dorothy is holding a very large um, silver shoe which is just Lisbeth Sverger's interpretation. When she puts the shoe on, it shrinks down to the size of her feet. But here's what L. Frank Baum wrote about what Dorothy was wearing. When Bach saw her silver shoes, he said, you must be a great sorceress. Why, asked the girl, because you wear silver shoes and have killed the wicked witch. Besides, you have white in your frock and only witches and sorceresses wear white. 
My dress is blue and white checked, said Dorothy, smoothing out the wrinkles in it. It is kind of you to wear that, said Bach. Blue is the color of the munchkins, and white is the witch color, so we know you are a friendly witch. I thought that was very interesting how L. Frank Baum uses clothing in his work. Here's a picture of the scarecrow. I just love her style. It's so different. I love the use of perspective in this one when they come across the tin woodman. I wanted to read one more passage that chats about when they got to the Emerald City, how they changed clothes. The next morning after breakfast, the green maiden came to fetch Dorothy and she dressed her in one of the prettiest gowns made of green satin. Dorothy put on a green silk apron and tied a green ribbon around Toto's neck and they started for the throne room of the great Oz. So of course, because they're all wearing glasses, one assumes it's all, they're actually wearing white, but I don't know, it could actually be green, but I have yet to see an illustrator who illustrates it as green and I suppose it's because of how um, great sorceresses in Oz wear white. I also just wanted to show you last where the cows are thrown up into the tornado, <laughs> like we saw in the Michael Haig version for the first time. The next one I have for you is by Sterling Publishing Company and it's from 2011, so we're in the 2000s now. This one is special because I actually won this through one of my fellow YouTubers and on her channel in search of wonder offered a giveaway and I entered the giveaway and it was for a gift card and I won the gift card and with the gift card I purchased this beautiful version of Robert Ingpen's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. I was so happy to have a new Robert Ingpen to add to my collection. It's stunning, it's really beautiful. I love everything about it, I love the in papers. I also found that this one is very interesting because not since Evelyn Copeman, at least not of the versions that I have anyways that illustrated the Wicked Witch of the West in green and he returned to the green version and I really just love this witch. One, one of the things I also love about the Robert Ingpen versions are uh, there's always an, art, um, an author bio at the front and I wanted to read a little bit of it. In an inscription to his sister Frank wrote, I have learned to regard fame as a will-o'-the-wisp which when caught is not worth the possession but to please a child is a sweet and lovely thing that warms one's heart and brings its own reward. I hope my book will succeed in that way, that the children will like it. I thought that was really cool that he wrote that. Kind of gives you a sense of the man. Frank Baum, by the way, was very much like the Wizard of Oz. He was moving from career to career and it wasn't until his 40s that he first wrote The Wizard of Oz. and. It, and followed it up with many, many versions uh, based in Oz as well as other books. We've um, actually read one of his other books, The Sea Fairies. Um, my son and I read it and I quite enjoyed it. I mean, it isn't The Wizard of Oz, but it was really neat and it was cool to read a adventure story with mermaids set in the ocean. But anyway, I just wanted to show you some of the illustrations. I love this interior. And one of the things I also love about this version is that it shows the metamorphosis of the Tin Man. It does it in the Lisbeth Zwerger edition and also in another edition I'm going to show you, but this one I feel is my favorite transition from man to Tin Man. So I thought that was pretty cool. But this is one of the most beautiful spreads in the book. I love this one. Here's the Emerald City. But yeah, just a beautiful version, and I just want to say thank you, Anne, from In Search of Wonder. Thank you so much. I felt so lucky to win it. I had to laugh because I never win anything, and I have now won two competitions on YouTube. I just won another the other day, and I'll talk about that one in one of my future videos and show you what I won. But I just had to laugh because <laughs> that never happens to me. But anyway, so thank you so much, Anne. I love this book so much. Published by Harper Design in 2013, I have this really cool version by Michael Sieben. And if you want to read around Halloween, this would be the version to go with. Michael Sieben is from Austin, Texas. And I really love what he did with this. It has embossed on the front cover, Courage, Brains, and Heart which I think is really cool. And then on the end papers, it has this map that starts with Dorothy's house and then goes th through the yellow brick road through the land of Oz. And it's continued on the back end paper. And look at this, this tree that is just so Halloween-like. But yeah, so if you are wanting to read The Wizard of Oz around Halloween, this is a great version. Here's that wonderful shot of the house on the witch's legs.
the field mice queen, the haunted forest. I don't know if you can see it, but there's the colors set throughout Oz. He follows the example set by W.W. Denslow, dividing the lands of Oz into the different colors. So just a really great version, especially if you're reading it around Halloween. Published in 2016 by Seven Seas Entertainment, we have this manga version of The Wizard of Oz. It also includes The Marvelous Land of Oz, the second book, which hasn't received as much illustration attention as its predecessor, which is a shame because The Marvelous Land of Oz as well as Ozma of Oz are both really good with a slew of amazing characters that you might know if you've watched uh, the movie Return to Oz. That movie has bits and pieces of the book um, combined in the movie. Does that make sense? <laughs> this wonderful map of Oz which is nice because it also includes the Gillikin country at the top, which is never spoken about much, if at all, in The Wizard of Oz. But I guess that's the purple color. Some more wonderful illustrations. Here's some more. The color illustrations are just at the beginning. The rest of the book is full of black and white illustrations, but they're just as cool. I really like them. They really modernize the text, which I think is wonderful. And there's the house. <laughs> with the witch's shoes. I love this one, when they're in the poppy field. If you have a kid who you'd love to start on classics, who loves manga, this one might be a good version to go with, as well as other manga classics. Whenever I do these Illustrator Explorers, I inevitably come across a version that completely surprises me. And I came across this one published in 2017. It's the Canterbury Classics version. And it's the wonderful Wizard of Oz illustrated by Sherry Zamazing. She's a British illustrator. But what's cool about this version is that it also holds W.W. Denslow's illustrations in black and white. So you'll have many of his illustrations throughout. And then you'll have Cherry Zamazing's illustrations. And I just think they make a perfect combination. Let me show you some more of her illustrations. It really pops quite nicely and is quite beautiful. There's another one of the Cowardly Lion. I love his red mane in this one. One of my other favorite depictions is the poppy field. So this is a beautiful one bound in cloth and has these red sprayed pages and very nice very surprising version that I was just very happy to find. I have one more unadapted version to show you and it is my Mina Lima, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, which is a huge favorite. This one came out in September 2021. If you're a fan of paper engineering, you will really like their series. M Mina Lima is a team of two illustrators. One is Mirafora Mina and the other one is Eduardo Lima. They worked on the Harry Potter films and they've been coming out with some wonderful versions of Harry Potter as well. But I particularly love their classics. Their latest one I think was Snow White and Other Tales by Grimm's that came out last year and I am chomping at the bit waiting for their next classic. I love what they did with The Wizard of Oz. Here's their version of the tornado and then I love how they dressed Dorothy, and she looks so different from all other Dorothys. They also stayed with the Denslow colors. I mentioned at the Robert Inkpen that there was an evolution of the Ten Man, and here's their version, which is also very charming and cool. Oh, and I forgot to mention that this one also comes with green glasses. Oh, everything's so green. Their version of the witch not green. And I wanted to show you one of my favorite paper engineering pieces is this one where Dorothy's silver shoes and she has to knock them together to get home. I thought that was really cool. I know that pop-up books and such are not for everyone, but this one's a really great combination between paper engineering and illustration. And the paper engineering is not so intense that it really adds too much bulk to it or makes it difficult to read when you're at home. So I really love these. I just think they're awesome and my son loves these versions. So that's it for the illustrated original editions of The Wizard of Oz. Now I'm going to show you a few adapted or condensed versions that I have on hand. The first one I want to show you is Charles Santori's version, The Wizard of Oz. And this is the version that will stay in your memory forever. It is absolutely gorgeous and luxurious in illustration. I think this one is actually condensed. All the writing is Baum's own writing. I'm not sure any other condensed version comes near to this. It's just magnificent. 
Here is when Dorothy first lands in Oz. There's the feet sticking out from the house. I love this one. I found it so autumnal. And this version actually covers quite a bit of the story that you don't find in the movie. And funny enough, there's an introduction by Michael Patrick Hearn, who is the author who Michael Haig got his big break through Cricket Magazine doing illustrations for that story that Michael Patrick Hearn wrote, The Porcelain Cat. He writes in his introduction about some of the things that inspired Charles Santori. And one of them I was delighted to find was the works of Antoni Gaudi. We went to Spain a couple of years ago and we visited his works. We were in Barcelona for a few days and I wanted to show you them so that you could see. I picked up this book, uh, Stroll with Gaudi, when we were at the Sagrada Familia gift shop. This is at Park Güell. And then there's the guardian here. They call it the dragon, but technically I think it was a salamander. And then there's that sort of that structure behind him. And then on this page is Casamila. You can see exactly that in his version of the Emerald City. So the undulating side edges. And then here's the guardian of the gate with that structure behind him. I thought that was really cool um, to know that Antoni Gaudi played such a role in inspiring Charles Santori when he did his, his artwork. Speaking of Barcelona, the next one I wanted to show you was a gift from my good friend Erica, who by the way also gave me the Mina Lima version. <laughs> so thank you Erica if you're watching this. But it is the Julia Sarda version of The Wizard of Oz. Julia Sarda is based in Barcelona. I love the cover and how it reflects. It's so beautiful. I love her artwork. I've shown you guys her artwork before in Mary Poppins. She's one of my favorite illustrators. Here we have the house with the witch's feet sticking out. When Dorothy discovers the scarecrow. I just love that scarecrow. The Wicked Witch of the West and she has green skin. She has Dorothy back in the white satin. It includes the Kalidas, it includes the dainty China country, it includes the spider beast that has to be overcome, it includes the monkey's golden cap. These are all elements of the story that often get left out of adaptations and so I just wanted to let you know that they are included. The Little Golden Book version by Don Turner and Don Turner, it's another one of those illustrators that I had a hard time figuring out anything about him, but I did see that he illustrated a version of Pippi Longstocking that I'll pop up on the screen. But I loved that the author, Mary Carey, called the cyclone a tornado in her writing. I had not seen that before. Most people stick to the cyclone naming. The illustrations are kind of wonderful. So anyway, just wanted to quickly pop in and show you this one before I went on. The final one I want to show you just came out in February and it is Italian illustrator Paolo Barbieri's version of The Wizard of Oz. I discovered this one from one of my Instagram friends, Semper Lex. She is, like me, someone who loves classics and loves illustrated classics. Paolo Barbieri does a lot of fantasy illustrations and you will see a lot of his artwork on countless covers. Among the people that he's created covers for are Michael Crichton, Ursula K. Le Guin, and George R. R. Martin. And his artwork is just amazing. Here is the tornado. I thought was cool that he had bits of green in there. Here's the scarecrow and the tin man carrying Dorothy out of the poppy field. There's the queen of the field mice. Very interesting depiction of her. There they are in the Emerald City with their glasses on. Here's the Dorothy with the Wicked Witch. And her skin is actually not quite green. He kind of left it up to the reader. Her skin is actually normal colored, but the green light makes it green in certain situations. So I thought that was very clever. I thought this was interesting because the Cowardly Lion is depicted as somewhat of a man more than a lion. Some of the pages are sketched, so which I thought was really nice too. It states on the front that it has excerpts from the original version, but when I was reading through it seems like it's more like just an adapted version. And it does include pretty much every part of their adventure. It doesn't leave out very much, if anything at all, that I've noticed. When I said lush worlds of fantasy, for example, when I showed you this one, if you look in the background, there's these shadows, these sort of stone sculptures or these heads in the background, like in the clouds or in the fog. And you see that throughout the book where you just have to look a second time. 
Well, that is it. I hope you have enjoyed all these illustrated versions of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Let me know in the comments which version you read as a child or if you have a particularly nostalgic attachment to one of those that you read from your childhood. Let me know. I'd be so curious to hear. If there is a version that you did not see in this video, do check out my website because I have more versions um, there that I just don't own. There are a couple that I would really like to add to my stash. One is from Michael Foreman and the other one is from B.S. Biro. I, I'm not sure how to say that name, but I would love to add those two older additions to my stash as well at some point. I also wanted to tell you that I noticed a version by Victor Tavares that will be publishing in November and it's really cool because the I'll pop up a picture of it but the edges are sprayed to look like the yellow brick road which I thought was really neat. I've come across Victor Tavares's work when I did my uh, Beauty and the Beast Illustrator Explore on my website and um, I really enjoyed his adapted version of the Beauty and the Beast. As usual the links are in the description box below. I hope you have a wonderful week full of courage, wisdom, and heart and I will see you next time. Bye.